impact. How long have we managed to prevent talking about this show? To, to delay the inevitable? Well, we've talked for uh, 37 minutes and 50 seconds. Well, not bad. This show sucked. Yeah, they all do. Yeah. Is that, it, that's a revelation impact. Actually, the, the one you the one you missed was the best one in months. Really? Yeah. Meaning it was merely bad. But hmm. show opened with chaos. No, let me tell you how the show actually opened. The show opened with the words "the network" and a clip of Mr. Anderson. That almost caused me to just not watch the show this week. I'm so goddamn fucking sick of the network, and I'm so goddamn fucking sick of Mr. Anderson. Thankfully, Mr. Anderson was actually not on the show, I don't think. I don't believe he appeared. <sighs> so actually, this was not the worst show of all time. Just for that. The worst babyface ever, aside from Velvet Sky, was not on this show. <laughs> so, Hogan and Immortal were in the ring. Sting and Rob Van Dam were coming down the, down the ramp to fight all nine of them. D'Lo Brown and Al Snow and uh, Irish Pat Kenny came down to break up the fight. No, they come down to stop... The two men from getting into the ring with eight. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what happened. It's very important to not let those two guys get in the ring and beat those eight guys' ass. <laughs> so Sting and RV or uh, Sting and Hogan started talking about the network executive. Sting said that she will be here next week. She. They had to. They could not help themselves but do a swerve. It's not a she, Vince. You know who it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's so, it's Mick care. Foley. Yeah. Yes, I just gave a spoiler without a warning. Oh, no one cares. So Immortal beat up uh, Pat Kenny and D'Lo, and Sting and RVD made the save to fight off eight men, and uh, Fortune joined them, and uh, Immortal bailed, and then Bobby Roode began to could he shoot promo on Hogan, saying he was proud of what he had done and proud of how hard he worked and how he'd earned all his money, and Hogan and Bischoff and Flair had come in and tried to ride on their coattails and... Said Hogan had done, had done nothing, done nothing but steal. Now his friend Jay Lethal was fired, a guy who did nothing but show up and work hard and do his best with the bullshit they gave him. And he's sitting there ranting about this and how terrible it was. And Hogan just says, "You're next." So okay, if he's next, why didn't Hogan just fire him? You know, Rude cut a great promo here, but I watched a ten-minute promo building up a match I'm never going to see. Yeah. That is true. And R- there was R- no follow-up on this show either for any of us. No, no. R- R- Rude's delivery was awesome, but uh, it didn't make sense in that way. And as, as you noted, Bobby Rude's not going to wrestle Hulk Hogan ever. And I also like the line about, uh, you know, Bobby Rude's talking about how I work hard, I earn every penny I make, because that's what they pay people in, in TNA is pennies. Mm-hmm. He put food on his kid's table, clothes on their backs, because he's a, he's a blue-collar worker. That's what he said. Is the idea that your your superstars are like famous rich guys? Not in TNA. They're blue collar workers scratching and fighting for every penny. Well, not just that. Robert Roode's in a tag team called Beer Money. The gimmick being James Storm has a lot of beer and Robert Roode has a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So they just killed that dead. You know the the thing also. People are going to say, "Well, Brian, uh, Steve Austin was a blue collar worker." Yeah, they never acted like Steve Austin wasn't making any money to wrestle. Yeah. Steve Austin, and, and everyone knows the real Steve, well, I shouldn't say everybody knows, but let me tell you about the real Steve Austin. The real Steve Austin made millions of dollars. In his best year, he made like $10 million. But his gimmick, which is actually his real life, is that he's a, a, a he is essentially the richest blue-collar worker of all time. He was not always a millionaire. No, when, when, he, went to, when he went to UFC a couple of years ago, uh, a man who made $10 million a year... He loaded up his dilapidated pickup truck, and he drove through the desert to Vegas. Yes. That's Steve fucking Austin. Yes. So, you know, it's it's possible to acknowledge that your pro wrestlers on a national television show make a hell of a lot of money and are rich, but they still haven't gone away from their blue-collar roots. Right. That's one thing. Correct. But to say that I'm a blue-collar worker who scratches for every penny I can make, that makes your your, your stars look like geeks. Quite frankly. And there was a lot of that Why on the are they show? working for the company that doesn't pay them any money? If Robert Roode is so good, why doesn't he go to WWE and make some money? Because they don't want him? It opens up a can of worms here. Yeah. Yes, that's probably a nitpick. Uh, it will but they be do this it, shit all the time. By the end of the show, it will be for sure. So the Jarrett's were somewhere. Actually, no, there's more. They, they, they talked about how next week, everything is going to change, Robert Roode said. Yeah. How many fucking times in the last couple of years have we heard everything is going to change? That's why I mentioned this a few times. I'll mention it again. 
The idea of changing the name from TNA to Impact Wrestling is the funniest fucking thing of all time. Because TNA actually features a lot of tits and a lot of ass. However, nothing on Impact ever has any impact whatsoever. This is an excellent point. So they're going from a name that actually is apropos to a name that is preposterous and bullshit. Impact Wrestling. And you know what's going to change? Nothing. Because I've heard a thousand times that next week, everything is going to change. And nothing ever changes. So this was infuriating. Go on. Speaking of tits and ass, the next segment involved Karen Jarrett and uh, Velvet Sky. So the Jarretts were dressed impeccably. They were backstage. I, I just couldn't figure out where they were, actually. I thought they were in a hotel. I guess they were in a trailer or something. But they were knocking on a door. Velvet answered wearing a towel. Karen wanted her in the ring later. I was trying to figure out where the hell they were and what was going on. The gist of this was the Jarrett's are convinced that Velvet Sky is Kurt's mystery woman, and they told her to come to the ring later. I don't know why we needed this segment. Mike Tanay then said the following words. A mystery masked man appeared on screen, and Mike Tanay said, Coming up next, it's the debut of Sangriento. Mm -hmm. The debut of who? (laughs) You've never mentioned before, even once. Even as a mystery. You, ne- you never even said, wait till you see the mystery man we have next week. No. You showed this guy who never seen him before, said the debut of Sanguiento, and we were supposed to care why. I'll tell you what was awesome about this. The next match was Sangriento versus Suicide. What this was, was Red versus yes. Chris Daniels. Yes. Except you covered them both in a costume. And so you got the same good match they would have had, except you had a quarter of the heat because nobody had any idea who Sangrienta was. Sure. And nobody cares about suicide. Astounding. I, I will not complain about anything that lets me watch Red Wrestle Daniels for like this five was minutes. A, this was a very good match. It was a very good match. It was very fun. It was a, a TV-length match. I'm not going to go crazy over it, but goddamn, it was fun TV. And they but why were, can't you just push red? Because you, you've, you've fucked it up so many times that now you've got to put him under a mask in fact, and a full costume to try to get fact, him over again. They pushed him under a mask and buried him without it on this show. Yeah, on the same show. Yeah, so Sanguinto won with kind of a springboard into a diamond cutter kind of thing. Uh, we had a Matt Hardy promo where he was talking about Bobby Roode being one half of Beer Money. And he said he himself was one half of one of the greatest tag teams ever. He promised to make a phone call next week and get someone very special. And said he's going to stand by my side and we're going to challenge Beer Money to a tag title match of sacrifice. Where in the hell was that? That was that was the one where we were trying to... He was, uh, no, I mean, I could have sworn I wrote all that down, but I can't even find it in my notes. I see. What what, what do you have as the next segment? The, the suicide match. It was in between. Oh, okay. So yeah. you skipped forward and then went... Okay, I no, see. No, it didn't. No, it went... The debut of Sangriento where he was walking around backstage. Well, we just talked about the match. And then you brought up Matt Hardy. Uh, yes, because you skipped it. I see. Okay. Well, we were talking about Sangriento, so I talked about the match. I see. Yeah. I I talk about it stream of consciousness as it happens. I, By I, the way, the, the, the telling thing about this promo is Matt Hardy, all he needed to say was, I'm cold blood Matt Hardy. I'm one half of the greatest tag team in wrestling history, and I'm going to teach Robert Roode a lesson. And that's actually what he said, and I presume that he was done because what more needs to be said? But there was more that needed to be said. And he talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And that's what a writer does. True. They write a lot so that the people running the company think, my God, what will we do without this writer? Who else can write all of this stuff? Matt didn't need to talk nearly as much. Just get your fucking point over with and move on. So back to the real time here. After the suicide match, we had... Hogan in his office, pissed off backstage, saying, it felt good to punch D'Lo. <laughs> uh, feeling many guys have probably felt. They were trying, still trying to figure out who the mole in the network is. Bischoff said maybe it was Flair. I love that. Didn't they just say in the first fucking promo that it was a she? And now these idiots spend the rest of the show talking about it being various care. guys. I don't care. I, don't <laughs> I care. care. I just don't I care. I care. Is it that hard to be consistent? Yes, apparently. It was said in the opening fucking segment that it was a her. Brian. And then he spent the rest of the show thinking of guys it might be? Brian. Yes? If they had not teased it being a woman in the first segment, would this segment here have been any better? Well, it would have made sense. I I would not have cared any more. Well, I would not have been pissed. All right. So that's a win. So the point being, they're still trying to figure out who the mole is. 
Bischoff suggested Flair. Hogan looked at the poster of Flair and said, No, Flair is dirtier than this. It can't be him. Ponder that for a second, everyone. So they're not that dirty. Rick Flair is still driving these guys nuts. Rick Flair is too evil to be their opponent. Mm-hmm. So Bischoff talked about Flair trying to take out his eye, but then said he was, quote, not feeling it. This was astounding detective work. <laughs> this, this is the opposite of the intelligence that found Bin Laden. Yeah. This was amazing. Then it was time for a fiesta. Hooray! It was Cinco de Mayo. Mexican America was in the ring. They had the flag out. They had pinatas. They had confetti. It was a grand old time. So they invited the Spanish announce team to join them. Willie Urbina and Hector Guerrero and... I can't handle Anarchia. Why not? I'm sure he's a nice guy. But he comes off as a guy doing a fake Mexican gimmick. Which is what he is. That's what they all are. <laughs> as you once said, it's a Texan, a New Yorker, a Puerto Rican, and a Canadian. Listen, a Canadian Mexican. listen. If you're someone that reads The Observer, okay? Which, unfortunately, is not the 1.7 million people that watch this show. If you're somebody who is who is a reader of The Observer, then this, this segment was awesome. Because you've got a whole bunch of fake Mexicans doing a Cinco de Mayo gimmick, and then they beat up Willie Urbina because he's not a Mexican. Correct. <laughs> okay, that's fucking hilarious. Yes. <laughs> now, for the 1.69 million people that do not read The Observer, you've got a guy that is coming off as a fake Mexican doing a Mexican gimmick, and I don't know. I, I, I must disagree with you here. I will take Anarchia talking over Hernandez talking Well, forever. Jesus Christ. Well, then what are you complaining about? Finny. It's not Hernandez. That's like saying, I'll I take... I am Mr. Silver Lining today. I'll take Murphy wrestling over Kozlov. No. And by the way... I wouldn't. It, that's but... neck and neck. <laughs> that is a tough call, but I don't think I <laughs> that would. That is not fucking praise. <laughs> Wow, I'll take someone talking over Hernandez. Yes. Jesus. I, I look at Anarchy as a ray of light. Oh, my. He's saving from further Hernandez promos. So, yes, as you noted, they uh, accused, they realized Willie Urbina is not Mexican. They beat him up. Hector defended him, so they said, well, if you're not with us, you're against us. They were going to beat him up, too. And then uh, Ink Ink made the save. They sent the Mexicans packing, and Jesse Neal cut every, uh, every pro USA, love it or leave it, Get your green card promo you ever heard. Fantastic delivery here for a very cliched promo. You know, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Move on. Daniels and AJ wrestled Gunner and Bully Ray. I'm going to say it. I don't know how to say this without making people angry. How can I say it? Just move on. Daniels and AJ wrestled Gunner and Bully Ray. They had a good match. AJ got a hot tag, ran wild. It was great. And then he got cut off. Then Bully Ray grabbed a chain, and the fans chanted Devon's name. Because, you see, like six weeks ago, they were having an awesome feud that just stopped, and the fans wanted to continue again. So Bubba grabbed the chain. He was going to kill AJ Styles with it. Tommy Dreamer ran into the ring, still employed. And uh, he looked at Bubba, and then he grabbed AJ, and he hit a pile driver. This caused the ref to rule it a no contest. Dreamer got to his feet. He was sad about this, but Bubba was happy, and he left, and Bubba was happy with the whole thing, even though Tommy Dreamer just cost him the match. He doesn't care. Matches don't mean a goddamn thing in this company. Who cares? That still pisses me off. Vince, first off, it shouldn't piss you off, because before Dreamer even ran in, mm -hmm. Bully Ray is... is uh, he was going to hit him with the chain anyway. Yeah, Bully, I see your Bully point. Ray had AJ down, <laughs> and all he had to do was pin him, but instead he just went to get a chain for... Absolutely no good reason. I, I do see your point. So, Bully has nothing to be mad about. He was going to get himself disqualified anyway, because he's an idiot. Yes. So the show blows. Backstage, Dreamer threw a tantrum. Fortune tried to figure out why he turned on them. <laughs> Fortune, the baby faces, said, we're either going to get answers or we're going to kick his ass. <laughs> Was not paying that close attention. The guy is clearly distraught at having to have made this decision. This is like this is like Velvet Sky and Angelina. It's close. You know, Velvet knows. Velvet knows that Angelina is being drugged and is not in her right mind. Yet she's still going to kick her ass. You know? Yeah. Uh, Bubba met with Matt Hardy. Asked how he is doing. Matt said okay. And then Bubba started bragging about what Dreamer did and explained that Dreamer, you see, because he's because Immortal's in charge, Dreamer needs to be his lackey to keep his job. 
because after 15 years as a pro wrestler, Dreamer is broke. <laughs> He's a blue collar worker. It is. It, it, well, the, the, he worked for every penny that he could get. Yes, this is the this is the Shawn Michaels uh, JBL storyline without even attempting to explain why Dreamer's broke. He just is. And the Michael storyline was stupid too. It was. Uh, we saw Winter giving Angelina her drugs. Hopefully, not diet pills. <laughs> Actually, it was a little blue pill. Oh, Make of no. that what you will. Oh, no. She gave Angelina her drugs. It said she would not be on them forever. She would wean her off them soon. And then she started spouting a bunch of New Age bullshit. She said their souls bonded a long time ago. She had crossed eons of time to find her. And uh, then they stood up, and all I know is there was like a, like a full second here where the only thing on TV were Angelina's boobs. Mm-hmm. TNA, everyone. So the Jarrett's came out, and they called out Velvet Sky. She came down. Karen said, this actually, I'll, I'll be honest, this was not nearly as horrendous as I was expecting. Karen said, and I, I think it's a direct quote, and I think it's also true, Velvet is the only woman in the locker room who has never been champion. I think she was the uh, Knockouts Tag Champions at one point, but probably not the but, singles that's true. She, she probably meant the singles belt, but think about that. Every other woman in the locker room has been champion at some point. Well, you got to realize there have been a lot of women that weren't champions that were released. Still! Well, why don't we go up and look at the actual roster and find out if that's true while you go on? All right. I, I'm, not, I'm not doubting the validity of it. I'm pointing out how pointless this title is. Oh, well, of course. It's, the whole point of a title is to show is to be exclusive. Not, you know, n- n- it's not supposed to be everyone gets a turn. Well, actually, they're wrong because in the very next segment, Miss Tessmacher came out who was not a champion. Uh, true. And <laughs> although, too, I, I, I Winter, believe... Winter has never been a singles champion. Oh, well, okay, that's a better point. And, yes. and she's involved in that angle. Yeah. I was going to say for Miss Tessmacher, I don't think she'd ever wrestled before that match. Actually, let me think about this. Uh, Angelina has been the singles champion. Uh-huh. Um, Madison Rain has. Yeah. Mickey James is now. Yeah. Miss Tessmacher is not. Rosita has not. No. Sarita has not. I don't think so. Has she? Velvet has not. Winter has not. Well, so actually, the majority have not. I stand corrected. Other than that. I guess Karen does too. Anywho. She did say Velvet had never been champion, and so she hits herself to Kurt's wagon so he could make her a champ somehow. And uh, the only thing I really got out of this is when <laughs> when uh, Karen said that Velvet had never been champion, Jeff Jarrett reared his head back and let out a belly laugh. A, a enormous cackle, and I howled. I got a belly laugh for you. Just a tremendous heel, yes. Ring name, real name. Angelina Love, Lauren Williams. Madison Rain, Ashley Simmons. Miss Tessmacher. Brooke Adams, Rosita, Thea Trinidad, China, China. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Apparently hey. that, that real name was so goddamn hard to find. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. No one on Wikipedia could get together to figure out what a real name was. Oh, my God. Holy shit. You know what Murphy's real name is? Eddie? I'm not making this Eddie up. Murphy? Michael Cole. Really? That can't be right. That should be his ring name, then. Wow. What a gimmick that would be. The real Michael Cole. Maybe Murphy's the GM. <laughs> that would rule. <laughs> Some irony. <laughs> All right, keep going. So, uh... If I can find any other good ones, I'll let you know. Good. Oh, God, Kazarian. Frank Girdleman? Yes, I knew he had something absurd. Uh. It's like, you, you wouldn't think Kazarian would actually be worse than his real name, and then you realize, oh, it is. So Velvet said she would never stoop to sleeping with someone to get ahead in the company. They screamed at each other for a while. Karen finally announced Winter and Angelina versus Velvet in a handicap match. So Winter and Angelina came out for this handicap match. Kurt Angle interrupted. He said he had talked to the network executives. And he did a poor job of explaining what was going on. Because I was (laughs) bewildered until the main event actually happened. (laughs) I don't know why I found this so funny. But Abyss... Christopher Parks. Yeah. <laughs> All this is a good reason to think it's funny. <coughs> oh, God. Is his father listed as Jim Mitchell? It is not his father. He was his dad in that storyline, wasn't he? I never cares. So, uh, the point of this that Kurt eventually made was that the main event was going to be himself and Velvet versus Angelina Winter and Jarrett. I thought it was two separate matches, and I had no idea what was going on. Am I the only one? I'm busy reading real names here. All right. So the women screamed at each other more. Velvet vowed to spank Karen. And the segment ended as the segments in TNA so often do with one woman screaming bitch loudly. A terrible segment this was. 
you remember this one? No, but the chief financial officer of TNA is named Dean Broadhead. I don't know what that means. Bischoff was walking backstage. I mean, was, you know what I'm going to try? I'm going to try and find some anagrams for uh, Dixie Carter, for example. That's a good idea. <laughs> All of this, by the way, is better than Impact. I don't give a fuck about this show. And if I'm doing this, uh, it's going to keep me from burying the show and people will be less angry at me. All right, go ahead. I'll try and listen in so I can throw in some. Bischoff was uh, pissed off that Kurt Angle was making matches. He ran into Rob Murphy and Terry. <laughs> They wanted to solve the problem by beating someone up. Bischoff just said they can beat each other up. He booked them against each other in a loser leaves town match. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he booked the match. They went to commercial break. When they came back, Crimson was walking backstage with a sledgehammer looking for Samoa Joe. Then they cut to the ring and, Ra- and Murphy was standing in the middle of the ring. They did a loser leaves town match with 10 seconds of TV time. Yeah. Built. This mm-hmm. is a new record. Yeah. So it was a bad sign for Murphy when he was standing in the ring and didn't even get an entrance. Rob Terry got his big entrance. And then Rob Terry, everyone, wrestled Murphy here on Impact. Yeah. It was not as bad as I thought it would be. No, it was fine. The only thing I can really say is Rob Terry's rope running is still ridiculous. It was like he he, he takes a step to hit the ropes and then realizes they are six feet farther away than he thought. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it was it was fine. It was two big oafs clubbing each other for a while. <laughs> Terry eventually won with what was basically a jackhammer. It did not suck. Now, the ironic thing is, after that, we had the most mind-blowing segment, perhaps, in Impact. Well, I can't say history. There's too many, but an, an amazing segment. They had this match. Two shitty guys had a match that was okay. Then we cut backstage, where Hulk Hogan is doing a face palm. He is rubbing his eyes and shaking his head. And Eric Bischoff said, Bleh. <laughs> He also got choked on conscious. <laughs> Actually, Bleh. that's only a mild exaggeration. What he said was, and this is a quote, That was bad, bro. Bad. Mm-hmm. Hogan said he was done with both these dudes. He couldn't believe they were fighting for a spot in Immortal. They booked a segment to suck. Everyone. Now, I don't know. I don't know if maybe they thought it sucked so bad that they added this later. I... I, I if so, why not take it off? You could have found something else to do with four minutes of TV time. I I uh, I was so amazed by this segment. This was one of two things happened. Either they took a match, which oh, I have seen a dozen matches worse than this on Impact, probably, probably this year. They took a match that was fine and buried it, or they booked something to suck. The workers, to their credit, made it not suck, but they stuck to the script and said it sucked anyway. He said he was done with both these dudes. They talked about how awful it was, and then they moved on from there to talking about the network more. They thought maybe the mole in the network was someone in the office, and I'm almost almost positive this is how it went down. They said maybe someone in the TNA office was feeding information to the network Hogan said, the people in this office know too much about this business. <laughs> the people in this office know too much about this business. Yeah. How many different ways is that funny in? <laughs> I couldn't believe they buried those two guys on the air. You what? I can't believe they, they, they buried those guys on the air. Like that. They destroyed them. I, I, they, I, I, they, they, cannot, they, cannot, they cannot ever be used again. Well, one, I, I assume... Murphy is gone from TNA. But, after this... Rob Terry apparently has to be gone either. You would think. How can you ever use Rob Terry again after this? Especially on the same show where they talk about firing Jay Lethal. Yeah. If you're cutting... By the way, did we mention that yet? What? The the, the, the Jay Lethal firing that they brought up? Uh, Rude did the opening promo. But yeah, let me talk about this. There's more. I, I'd totally forgotten about this until so you brought it up. Plus, I was looking at all these anagrams. So, he's cutting a promo... And uh, he's burying Hulk Hogan. And he says, Hogan, you crushed people's dreams. Like Jay Lethal, who you fired. So, apparently, they realized that firing Jay Lethal was so fucking stupid that they had to pin it on the top heel in storyline. I don't know. 
Well, in real life, was he fired or did he quit? No, he's done. I I, I thought he quit. I, I think they fired him. Oh, well, that's that's astounding then. So they fired him. Now they've they've apparently fired Murphy and Rob Terry because they fucking suck, even though they had a decent match. And then I guess later in the show we'll talk about the uh, X Division guys. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, by the end of the show, I was fine with them being fired. <laughs> but so Crimson found Joe. Now the deal here, Brian, you missed a week. Uh, last week, Crimson was wrestling Joe when Abyss came down to attack him, and Joe did not help. Joe walked to the back. That's why Crimson was, Crimson was mad. So, Crimson, let's see. Joe said he never needed help when he was undefeated. Crimson said, well, I don't need your help. Which begs the question, why are you so fucking angry? Why are you hunting him down if you don't need his help and you're disappointed he didn't help you? So finally he said, if you're going to stay out of my way... Stay out of my damn way. It appeared that he'd stay out of his way to me. I'm not making this up. If you're not going to stay out of my way, stay out of my damn way. Or excuse me, if, if you're going to stay out of my way, stay out of my damn way. Oh, fuck, who cares? Mickey James wrestled Miss Tess Mocker. This, Miss- this got a thumbs up. After all these months <laughs> and years, wish it did. They, they finally put her in a pair of tights to expose her ass. They put her in booty shorts. Yeah. That was a win. She came out in a, in a skirt and uh, and not even a very tight skirt. I was, I was, my mind was boggled for about the fourteenth time in the show. And then she did a strip tease, and yeah, it, it worked. Um, so Mike Tanay recap the Miss Testmacher angle. You recall she was a prostitute who was then demoted to pro wrestling. <laughs> and uh, that was the gimmick, everybody. That is the gimmick. And uh, then, according to Mike Tanay. Miss Tessmacher herself realized she was not ready for in-ring competition. So she so she went away and she trained for four months. Well, on the bright side, they didn't say she trained at the TNA Academy. Because, holy God, was she horrible. She looked like someone who had trained for four months. This match was so much worse than the Rob Terry match, and these two didn't get fired. No. Well, I don't want them fired. But uh, it was a bad wrestling match. <laughs> And it went a long time. Yes. So I'm not sure who decided the Miss Test Mockers. I, I don't think she ever wrestled in WWE. And I'm pretty sure she has not wrestled in DNA. I believe this was her first wrestling match on TV in her career. And it went like four minutes. Oh, yeah, of course. And uh, she couldn't lift her up. No. Mi- she had to lift her up for a finish and couldn't get her all the way up. Mickey did not idiot proof this enough. <sighs> Things were way too complicated. They tried to do the Lucha spot where you sweep the leg, make a cover, and then switch. And uh, Brooke just froze. Just had no idea what she was doing. So, yeah, Mickey finally won with her move. This, well, I can't call it a fail because they're really hot women, but it was not a good match. Then afterwards, Tara and Madison came out, and the funniest part of the show, Tara got a new shirt for herself that reads, Tara Nonstop Reaction. I really, really hope she didn't pay a lot of money for that. (laughs) So... Oh my god, this segment. Oh, Jesus. Madison wants a rematch for the title. Mickey said, okay, but you have to sacrifice something. Madison says, okay, what? Mickey says, the sacrifice is that if I beat you, Tara's contract with Madison ends. Mm-hmm. Setting Tara free. Let's review what happened. Let's take a walk down memory lane in TNA history. I you know the entire thing here. I'm sorry? Go ahead. I will make it as short as possible. Madison once beat Tara in a Loser Leaves TNA match. Tara disappeared. Then she came back, and it was revealed that Madison brought her back to work with her. So in theory, the only thing keeping Tara in TNA is uh, this contract that Mickey wants voided. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So yes, Mickey is fighting to get Tara fired. Tara's happy about this. No, she's she's fighting to get her out of control of... Yes. We're supposed to forget all of that. Right. Yeah. They, ex- they expect their fans to be stupid. No, the, the, to me, I, I thought you would bring up the more obvious fact. The fact that for two straight pay-per-views, Madison beat N- Mickey because Tara interfered. And now Tara is Mickey's best friend that she's trying to free. That too. That is stupid. <laughs> the whole thing is stupid. This is like this is like me. Uh, I don't know. This is like I don't, I don't. I don't want anything to be an analogy to this. If Russo got fired, 
And I made some sort of stipulation where, where if something happened, Russo would get put back on the TNA writing team. That's how stupid this is. It was stupid. Speaking of stupid, Brian Kendrick, Amazing Red, and Generation Me were angry that their friend Jay Lethal had been fired. Generation Me apparently are friends again. Yes, out of the blue. <laughs> They're walking around backstage, storming through uh, the, the uh, hallways. and As are Ink Ink, by the way. Yes, again, inexplicably back being friends. So, yes, they, they were said they were going to uh, hunt down their boss and get some answers. And Listen, I've been in buildings where people were being let go and everyone was scared for their job. Let me tell you something. Storming angrily into the boss's office is a bad way to ensure job security. Kendrick apparently flipped out on him in real life and they uh, just booked it. Well, I guess so. They turned it into this storyline here. And uh, Bischoff buried them all. He said if they wanted a chance, they needed to grow a foot and a half, yeah. gain some weight, mm-hmm. called them sawed-off runts. Throwed coffee on them. Throwed coffee at them and said, if you don't like it, get a job elsewhere. And they hung their heads, and they scuttled away like losers. Yeah. Bischoff told them, by the end of this, I was on Bischoff's side. <laughs> they just they just took it in the ass. They realized they had no leverage. They had no right to complain. They were lucky to have these jobs, and they walked away. <laughs> well, just a... Uh, they were very worse than Murphy on the show. Well, yeah. Murphy at least has enough self-respect to get out now. M- Murphy at least went down fighting. Not these guys. These guys they went, their heads in shame. Damn, I guess we got to try to figure out how to grow. And we're not done with them that. Okay, anybody who normally writes me letters telling me how great Impact is and how I'm so mean <laughs> for ripping it apart, will you please tell me why Generation Me are friends again and why Ink Ink are back together? Tell me. Okay. I'd like to know. Because on a good show, they'd still they, the, the storyline would continue. It would not just be dropped. That's just me. A highlight video with Sting and Rob hype talking about their title match. The best part of this was Sting. I, I wish I had written this down. I don't have the exact quote. But he talked about how the whole key point in they coming in was when Abyss murdered Rob Van Dam, tore skin off, and they stripped him of the title. And Sting said something very close to these words. He was stripped of the title. I still don't understand every detail of that whole deal there. <laughs> yeah. Me neither, Sting. Me neither. Sting was very good here, and Rob was fine. I thought, aside from the stupidity of that line being in here, I thought, aside, and I don't blame Sting for that, by the way. Aside from that, I thought this was actually really good. It was very good, but but something serious like this in the middle of such a preposterous show, it's well, not going to sure. do you any good whatsoever. I, I agree, but hey, I'm not going to knock this. So then we had the main event. It was Kurt Angle and Velvet Sky versus Angelina Winter and Jeff. Angelina's gimmick, and they did this last week too. She's on drugs, so she doesn't sell anything until she does. <laughs> yes. They did a spot <laughs> where she's standing in the middle of the ring, and Velvet walks up to her and punches her in the face repeatedly and kicks her in the gut repeatedly, and Angelina just stands she, there. She does the Terminator no-sell. Yeah, just doesn't sell a goddamn thing. So then Velvet hits ropes and spears her, and then she's flopping around like a fish, yes. selling her abdomen. I don't know. It makes no sense. So Angelina kicked her ass for the heat, literally. They immediately went to commercial. When they came back, it was time for the hot tag. Yeah. Well, I don't really need to see Velvet wrestling for a whole commercial break. But anyway, Kurt got the hot tag. He ran wild, put Jeff in the ankle lock. Karen grabbed Jeff's hand from the outside, so Kurt dragged him into the ring. Then Velvet tagged herself in. She DDT'd both girls and pinned Winter. For some reason, this infuriated Karen. Actually, you're missing the best parts of this match. That's entirely possible. Angle drags them both in the ring. Velvet gets a blind tag to go after Karen. None of this is a DQ, by the way. Karen's yeah. all over the ring. Yeah. An extra human in the ring. It's not a DQ, don't worry. So Angelina and Winter jump Velvet from behind. Even though it's two-on-one in the ring, Angle, who is in the ring... Nonchalantly gets out of the ring and stands on the apron waiting for a tag. Yes. <laughs> Way to go, gentlemen. <laughs> so then she hits her double DDT, pins winner. Karen has a freak out. God only knows why. Angle congratulates Velvet and then announces she was not the chosen one. Uh, the chosen one was someone or something Karen could not fathom. It's going to take her out for good. And then he can whoop Jeff's ass one-on-one without distraction. Because you see, at lockdown, in a steel cage match... Actually, what happened in that match? 
Jeff won because That's of right. a yeah, lot of there, interference. Yeah, there was interference. So and yeah. Kurt had a chance to win and went back inside. Yeah, way to go, Cage. Way to go, Kurt. And then Kurt made sure to throw a uh, bitch in there for good measure as well. Uh, indeed. So then we had the latest mind, mind-boggling segment on the show. Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff were leaving the building, still bitching about the network, going to their rental car. And what a car this was. <laughs> Hulk Hogan, everyone, is on rough financial times. <laughs> this. Remember the white Hummer? Remember the days of the NWO and the stretch limousines? He got into a red compact. <laughs> so they walk up to before he got in he noticed on the words someone had <laughs> tagged his car badly I cannot believe this show <laughs> someone had badly tagged his car with the words you're next so they said oh my god Goldberg's the network guy can you believe this Goldberg <laughs> yes he's the network guy Goldberg you know it's funny well, there's a couple of reasons this is funny, but there, there's actually a Seattle lawyer named Bill Goldberg, who does, he's a divorce lawyer, I hear his commercials all the time, but maybe it's him. May as well be, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Why not? So they were bitching, they got in their tiny little car and drove away, and then it was revealed that Brian Kendrick, Generation Me, and Amazing Red had been hiding in the bushes. <laughs> Smoking. <laughs> Smoking. <laughs> Smoking, everybody. Smoking in the bushes and vandalizing cars. And they came out and they were giggling. <laughs> Literally like high schoolers. No, junior high kids. Junior high kids. Actually, that is better because the junior high kids would find it cooler to be smoking while they tagged the car. Yes. And they're giggling and saying, we got him. They looked... <laughs> so stupid. I mean, okay, we talked before about how Generation Me looked 12 and Amazing Red is a very small baby-faced man in... None of them looked older than 10 years older. <laughs> no. This was... Th- th- these look like out-of-control childish brats who need a good beating. <laughs> this is nothing I wanted to cheer for, nothing I ever wanted to watch again. Yeah, I don't know how many weeks they could have paid G. Lethal for the amount of money it's going to cost <laughs> to clean off that fucking car that they tagged tonight. Or, or the uh, truck that uh, Sting destroyed with a bat last week. You know how many weeks they could have paid for Jay Lethal with that money? A few. But they had to do an angle, and they didn't even show one fucking replay of that on this show. Or maybe they did the beginning when Mr. Anderson was there. I don't remember. But uh, they didn't do more than one. So, yeah. Uh, this is a horrible television show, everybody. <laughs> Waste of... This is the worst of pro wrestling. <laughs> Ever. If, if, if you're barely hanging on as a fan, don't watch this show, because it'll be the end of you as a fan. It just sucks. It just sucks. Let's uh, let's play a song and wrap this up today. I I uh, I really can't take no more of this. Uh, what do we got? To the back. All right, let's do uh, Impact here. An average show. It was just another episode of Impact. It was not a horrible show, but there was it was you know. All I gotta know, everybody, is this was a fucking go home show, where the main event was a match to determine who was getting the shot at the next pay per view, not the one Sunday. <laughs> The one after that. Yeah. That was your go-home match. It was a match to determine who gets a shot at the next show. Uh-huh. That was not the stupidest thing on the show either. I, all right. I don't know what happened. Show opened with Hulk Hogan with a... <laughs> you don't know what happened? I don't remember. Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan was in the parking lot with a pipe. He was oh, you a, mean the dumber thing on this show? I honestly, as of right now, remember nothing about this show except the main event and the promo that followed. Hmm. So I'm going to go through my notes here. It'll be like a new experience for, for both of us. It sucks to be you. Hold on. <laughs> I have to go through it again. Yes, you Hold can relive this. Hold in the parking this. lot with a lead pipe he wanted to kill. This was stupid. The- <laughs> we started off with one of the dumbest things on the show. Hogan is pacing backstage with a metal pipe, which he says he's going to use to bean the network guy when he shows up. That was his fucking plan. Right. When a guy from Spike TV shows up, I'm going to hit him with a steel pipe. Bischoff talked him out of it. <laughs> Bischoff, the voice of reason, saying, no, no, you can't just murder people. That I swear to God, that's how this show opened. Yeah. Hogan was going to hit a Spike executive with a pipe. That was his idea. <laughs> and then he would still be in charge. Mm-hmm. The <laughs> what a stupid idea. Jarrett's came out. They wanted a truce with Kurt. 
Jeff Jarrett openly acknowledged that he had mockingly offered truces in the past, but this time he was serious. <laughs> Letting fans know that everything he says is bullshit. Uh, they were afraid that harm would befall Karen at the pay-per-view. Karen said she was the mother of Kurt's children. Kurt finally came out, called them Karen and Mr. Douchebag, said they kept pushing his buttons, said Karen would eventually leave Jeff and take all his money just like she did to him. And Jeff, Jeff's expression when he heard this was surprise, but uh, but believability. So anyway, Angle said he, his mystery woman would be there, but she'd be out later, and Jeff would know who she was. So that was the big scandal. This was fine. It was Karen it. was not too screechy. No. Everybody loved Kurt. Jeff is funny. Jeff is damn funny. I mean, this is doing nothing for business, but it Who was cares? fun. It was fun. Well, they don't care. Why should I care? And when Kurt said that this person was someone that Jeff knew, uh, like like your your stereotypical uh, bitch woman, Karen just went nuts. You know this person? Who is this woman? Well, Pretty good segment. This woman has been threatening her safety. Well, sure. It's reasonable. But him saying be. that Jeff knows her doesn't mean he knows her in the fucking biblical sense. No. Karen should know that. That's not why she was angry. She was angry because Jeff knew who was going to kill her and wasn't telling her. Yeah, but that's it's, he, he didn't say that you know her in the sense that you know who it is and I'm not telling you. It's just you know this person. I could say, Vinny, someone's coming over tonight. It's a secret. You know who this is. That doesn't mean you know who it is. It means you know the person. All he said was, you know this woman. I did not, I, when he said this, I did not think, this must be a woman Jeff Jarrett has boned before. No, but, but when, when Kurt Angle said, Jeff, you know this Why woman. Why are we talking about this? Because, because, I'm explaining. When, when Kurt said, Jeff, you know this woman, Karen responded like, that meant that Jeff knew who no. the person was, but wasn't telling her. That's not why she was angry. Wait, well, yeah, the, like, she, she thought, okay, no, I... Yes. It's not, the, the, the biblical sense has nothing to do with it. <laughs> That's She's true. Up, okay. Yes, she was upset that Jeff... Okay, well, we agree then. <laughs> the fuck are we arguing about? I just want people to go back and make a drop of you saying no, yes, no, yes, no. And apparently all those things meant the same thing. <laughs> yes. This is how my brain works, everyone. <laughs> this is what's going on in my mind all the time. Yes. Tara and Madison wrestled Mickey James and Miss Tess Mocker. For the record... Miss Assmacher. Is that what I said? That's what I said. May as well. For the record, Miss Tessmacher was, at worst, the second best worker in this match. I don't know what happened to Tara and Mickey James, but the double drops, drop kick spot they attempted was the most embarrassing, cringeworthy thing on Impact, wrestling-wise, in years, perhaps. Years? They I, w- threw- I would say in a couple of weeks. They? No. Dude. <laughs> This was bad. This was worse than anything in Tessmacher's match last week. They <laughs> sort of jumped and kind of threw their feet at each other where their ankles had been a second ago. This was atrocious. Now, when you say this was better than Tessmacher's match last week, you're still only going back a week. I'm sure if we went back three weeks, we could find a spot just I, as bad. Don't get me wrong. 20 bucks to anyone who can find a spot on Impact this year worse than this. Oh. I had 20 American dollars. <laughs> that was a mistake, Vinny. I, Our board is, is uh, they'll they'll find something. If they you may wanna, find 100 things. You, sca- you owe $2,000. Yeah, no, no, for, for only one. For, first, first come, first serve. All right. So, anyway, then Tessmacher got in. She hit a victory roll. I was terrified she was going to die. Instead, she got it perfectly fine. And then Tess Mocker pinned Madison Rain to set up Madison Rain challenging Mickey James with Tara's freedom on the line of the pay-per-view. Yeah. What? Because they're dumb! They're fucking dumb. This would be the dumbest thing ever if they didn't do something this stupid every week. <laughs> they weren't fucking impact. Yeah, Miss Tess Mocker pinned the challenger for the title at the pay-per-view. Right. Tess Mocker's not on the show. Right. I don't know why Tess Mocker's pinning Madison unless Madison's just going to win the belt back. In which case, what was the point of Mickey winning the belt in the first place? None of this... This was all dumb, no matter what happened. Yeah. So, Not that anyone was buying the show for that that Mickey James... But you could try. You could try. Flair arrived. He and Hogan screamed at each other for a while. Then they were friends. I like when Flair was like, I've been out dealing with my shoulder surgery. He's not wearing a sling. Nothing. He's, he's, he's dealt with it. He's just fine. He was dealing with it psychologically. Hmm. Tara was cutting a promo about how she wanted to be free from Madison's contract. She did this in a way that was supposed to be funny and was not. She did it in a way where where you wanted her to remain a slave. Uh, a mute slave. 
So then she called Madison a brat, but Madison heard and thought she said rat. Yeah. Insider terminology, dude. They're sh- what I didn't even thought of that. They're shooting. I get it. Wow. Because Tara was very clear to, 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 to say that she said brat, not rat, because that would be worse. I see. Which it would be. She called her a brat. Yeah. On impact. Uh-huh. That's funny, actually. <laughs> Is that like a response to to the term bitch being used 45 times in a single segment? This week they decided to use brat. I guess. I don't know. Then we had a segment that sucked dick. (laughs) Tommy Dreamer was on the phone. He would not talk to the interviewer guy. The interviewer guy wouldn't leave him alone to the point where I felt bad for poor Tommy. I like when the interview guy just goes, do you feel bad about what you did last week? They just, um, can we have? That's what Impact does, though. Can we have? They expect you. They expect you to have an encyclopedic, photographic memory of everything that's ever happened on the show, except for when they don't want you to. You know, if Dave Meltzer were writing this show, who does have an encyclopedic memory, then I can understand if the show expected you to have one, because the head writer has one, so he just presumes everyone does. But Vince Russo does not have an encyclopedic memory. He can't even remember his own shit from the week before. So that this makes no sense that they expect us to have an encyclopedic memory. Which makes sense because it's impact. And you know what's funny is when when uh, when Dreamer was like, or when they asked him, you know, about what you did last week, I thought, I wish they would have explained to the people what he did last week. At least I know. Last week he, and then I was like, what the fuck did he do last week? <laughs> did Dreamer do and last finally week? finally AJ showed up and I was like, oh yeah, he, he attacked AJ and set up a feud that I don't want to see. Yeah, so uh, speaking of, AJ showed up here in this segment. He wanted to know why Tommy attacked him. Tommy said he was too young and innocent to know what Dreamer was going through. But he'd never understand. They so apparently talked, he's the little boy that will talked, never grow up. And talked and talked and talked. And Tommy asked, what would Tommy Dreamer do? I don't care. This was awful. It sucked. It went from there to ambushing Sting. He said he had his hands full with Rob Van Dam. He... Said he'd be fighting for his life this Sunday, but sometimes that brings out the worst in you, and sometimes it brings out the best in you. He had a beer money versus Matt Hardy and mystery partner hype video. (laughs) In hindsight, I love this one. So, beer money came down to the ring. They called out Matt. He came down. He talked about Rude's promo last week. Said he became became a man. He said he was one of the one half of one of the greatest tag teams of all time. But Storm was just a drunk, and Rude was just an arrogant Canadian. He talked and talked and talked. This is another example of writing. There's Since a lot of- when is Rude's gimmick? I guess he was in Team Canada. Years ago. A long time ago. Now he's supposed to be a rich guy. But that- apparently we're supposed to think that it's a shoot that he's just a crazy Canadian. I guess. Who a blue collar man. Yeah. I-, I guess they've dropped that gimmick even though it's still beer money. Should be just beer and beer. That'd be a great name for a team anyway. But- well, beer money is like, you know, three bucks now. All right, that works. So, anywho, uh, Storm finally, uh, Storm finally, thank God, cut Matt off. Cut a much better promo. Talked about all the st- all the all the things he had done, and that he was a tough guy who would go to a bar and beat you up and take your girl home and make you buy a beer while he fucked her. And he said, uh, "Get your brother out here." Matt said, "I'm gonna, sh- I'll show you my partner. Uh, well, we won't fight tonight. We'll fight a sacrifice." You have to pay to see the best team ever. And then he said his partner was not Jeff. It's someone who knows Storm inside and out. Storm didn't care. That's lewd. Yeah, sure. He was about to do his catchphrase when the America's Most Wanted theme song started playing and out walked Braden Walker. <laughs> Actually, Braden Walker did walk out. Chris Harris did not come out. This was not Chris Harris, everyone. I thought, perhaps, when I heard that he was back, maybe there are new fans who don't remember this, there was once a wrestler named Chris Harris, who seemed to have talent and potential. Then he got to ECW and became Fat Braden Walker and disappeared. I thought in his time away, perhaps he'd, uh, you know, reinvigorated himself, reinvented himself, but reapplied himself. Nope. He just ate more. He came out looking very fat. He had an expression on his face that I can only describe as dumb. He wow. stared at Storm dumbly, like a dumb person would, a dumb fat guy. Jesus. Storm <laughs> stared back at him, thinking, honestly, I think Storm thought the exact same thing I thought. Like, Jesus, this is going to be easy. They went to commercial. Wow. This is quite the burial of poor Chris Harris. Hey, <laughs> do you disagree? 
<laughs> oh, no. Do you think Chris Harris... Were you impressed when Chris Harris walked out? I didn't think he looked smart. Do you think he looked in shape or dangerous? No. No. <laughs> he had a deer in the headlights look. Yeah, kind of did. A fat deer, I presume. <laughs> yeah. If he was a deer in the headlights, it was too fat to escape. A pig in the headlights? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> the fat animal. Panda bear? <laughs> Panda bear. <laughs> Sangria and Russell suicide... My first thought was, didn't you just do How this about match a musk last week? Ox. <laughs> what animal does Chris Harris most resemble at this point? A musk ox. How about a python that just ate a pig? A musk ox. That's gone. When they announced that Sanguinto was wrestling suicide, my first thought was, didn't they just do this match last week? I think we may have seen the same match twice. And you know what? Then I thought about it and said, I'm fine with this. Yeah. Wrestle every week. I don't care. Well, apparently they will now, as we'll find out soon. Great. So you they know, had another good match, saying we had to win again. And, and, yeah, listen, I don't want to say anything bad about the match. It was a good match. I enjoyed it. I had fun watching it. But does TNA realize, and when I ask that, when I when I preface it by saying, does TNA realize, it's a rhetorical question. Of course they don't. Do they realize that your average fan sees Sangriento on TV being billed as a new high-flying luchador and immediately think it's a Sin Cara ripoff? It is, though. That's his I mean, gimmick. I'm not just making this up because I've had like a dozen people email me in the last couple of weeks with this same comment. Does TNA realize that this comes off as a direct ripoff of Zin Cara? So I guess the answer is no, they don't get it. But No, uh, I, I think the answer is they do. That's their intent. Oh, I see. They want people to know they're ripping off Zin Cara. Hmm. I don't, they, maybe they think it'll be funny. I don't know. So then they had a great match for the second week in a row. And Hogan and Bischoff come out and just interrupt. Because well, they're the, the stars, it, it and the ended. other guys are little. At least it ended. Yeah, but they couldn't go to commercial and come back or no. cut backstage. They, they had to come out before Sangriento could celebrate. They came out. Sangri- Sang- At least Sangriento escaped. I thought for sure they were going to have yeah. Hulk Hogan beat him he up. He ran away like a little kid. Well, that's better than him staying and getting beat up. I guess. I, I'm a glass half empty kind of guy, so I always think a worse alternative than what they could have done. So, uh, for example, poor Suicide was laying there. Ric Flair beat him up. So, let me th- talk th- about th- this segment. Then they commercial. Let me talk about this segment. So, Hogan calls out the network guy, and out comes Mick Foley. Let's get the positives out of the way first. Foley had a lot of passion. That's it. Let's talk about the negatives. When TNA taped this television show, and I read the spoilers on the Observer site, Dave did a pretty goddamn good job explaining the storyline. He explained that the network has, uh, I guess, given Foley the the role as the uh, network ambassador, whatever the word is, and uh, the network has has, uh, canceled TNA because Hogan and Bischoff have all this supposed power, so they've canceled TNA, and in its place, they've created a new show called Impact Wrestling, and the show is going to be all about wrestling now. There's going to be more wrestling on the program, and Foley and the network are now in charge, and I guess Hogan and Bischoff are largely out of power because of this. This is the way it was explained on the Observer site. I don't know if there was just so much good stuff on this show, like the shit with Tara and Madison Rain backstage, There was so much good writing that had to make the air that they butchered the fuck out of this segment. But to your average person watching this segment, your your average viewer watching this segment who didn't read any spoilers in the Observer site, you would have virtually absolutely no idea what was going on here. Foley came out, and he shoved down Bischoff. He said the show was not about Hogan or Immortal anymore. It was about wrestling. He said that wrestling mattered again like it was when he was a kid. He had one single throwaway line about how it's no longer Impact or TNA. It's now Impact Wrestling. He said this was the day when Hogan stops making a difference. He said there's a battle royal tonight. 25 men. No politics or gamesmanship. Just a match to determine who would be the number one contender. And by the way, there was politics and gamemanship in that match. And then introduced... Um, Jeff's partner on, uh, or I'm sorry, Angle's partner in the match with Jeff and Karen. It was China in 2000 fucking 11, looking like a cross between Michael Jackson and the alien from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And that was the end. And then when they came back, they had to have Mike Tanay attempt to calmly explain this entire storyline to us. They did a horrible job here. And this was like, this was like their big storyline of the year. Yeah. You know? 
This was they've been building this up for months, and it got butchered all to fuck. And the whole thing was like maybe three minutes long, butchered to hell, made no sense, and and they just moved on. I also like that the uh, Foley makes the introduction that he's going to bring out. Here is Kurt Angle's tag team partner. And then the name China appears on the screen. There's a cloud of smoke. And then a hominid appears in the smoke. And just before she steps out of the smoke, so you can see her, they go to the crowd. Of course. TNA director, everybody. Yeah. And you want to know why that got butchered all the hell? Because it was very important to have an Anderson promo bitching about his title shot, which we've seen on every goddamn show for the past 6,000 episodes, followed by a completely pointless three-way match with Joe, Abyss, and Crimson, which saw Abyss hit Joe with the black hole slam, and Crimson stole the pin, the finish of every fucking three-way of all time. And then, afterwards, Abyss ends up beating up Christian, so nobody got over here. Joe got pinned... Uh, yeah, and then, yes, and then Crimson got beat, and, uh, also, Abyss, they, it was a three-way, so they did the bit where one guy takes a rest while the other guys wrestle, only they did that a minute in. Mm. Yeah. There was also, by the way, uh, in between, right before the Anderson promo, there was a Foley promo where he basically repeated everything he said in the prior segment, it just made no more sense. 25 Geek. Oh my god, this shot. Battle Royal. <laughs> oh my god, this shot. The TNA roster standing in line waiting to get into the Battle Royal. Mm -hmm. uh, the circus geeks would look down on this crew. You know, they had a Battle Royal. It was every Battle Royal you've ever seen. It wasn't horrible. It, well, it, it was, but Battle Royals are. It wasn't really all that good. No. But the highlight of this is just in the greatest TNA moment of, of at least the last five minutes. TNA decides that they're going to plug their Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> you know, Facebook and Twitter are real big nowadays in the, in the sports entertainment world. So I hear. You've got all these WWE guys on Twitter, and, and they're always talking about Twitter on TV, and, and UFC is now giving out bonuses to the most creative tweets from their fighters and, and all this and that. So TNA is getting in on this game. We're going to plug our Twitter and our Facebook. So they put a graphic up on the screen. You're laughing. Yes, I am. Now, does the graphic say, for example, Facebook.com slash TNA Wrestling? I, I don't think it said that, no. Say Facebook.com slash Impact Wrestling. Uh, no. How about Twitter.com, TNA Wrestling, or Impact Wrestling, or anything like that? I, I, I didn't see any of that. You know what it said, the graphic on the screen that they put up to plug their Facebook and Twitter? What was that? It said, and I fucking quote, find us on Facebook. Yeah. The, you must find them. You must hunt them down. They are hidden. You know there's a fake Brian Alvarez on Twitter? They have a secret Facebook page. I did not know that. Brian Alvarez, LOL. I don't know who it is, but there's a fake me on Twitter. So try to imagine how many non-official TNA-related pages there must be on Facebook. And their brilliant idea is just to say, find us on Facebook. That tells you everything you need to know about this company. Right there. <laughs> it was pretty that encapsulates everything you need to know about, about Impact. It was pretty TNA. amazing. Find us on Facebook. <laughs> so anyway, they had a match. And the Battle Royal. It came down to Angle, Jarrett, Bully Ray, and Anderson. Anderson and Bully Ray ended up just on the floor. Just not being in not being eliminated, but not being in the ring. So then Kurt went to throw Angle out. He had Jeff up on his shoulders, and he approached the ropes. But Karen Angle, from the floor, put one hand on Kurt's knee. This prevented Kurt Angle, Olympic gold medalist, from advancing and throwing his opponent over the top rope. So they wrestled more. Karen got involved. Kurt pulled her into the ring, but as he tried that, Jeff uh, threw him out. So Jeff now thinks he has won. Can't blame the guy. He's the only man in the ring in the Battle Royal. He's celebrating with Karen. They won't play his music. He is a little confused. China appears, eliminates him. She has a stare down with Karen. I was sure she was just going to power bomb her here on the show. And uh, she grabbed her, but Jeff pulled her away and they fled. So then it was down to nobody. The ring was just empty. Then Anderson and Bully Ray got back in. They wrestled a little bit more. And finally, Anderson won. You want to know what happens when I go to Facebook and I type in TNA? Tits and ass? 
the very first thing that comes up, I swear to God, is TNA Death Pool Group. Awesome. Followed by TNA Wrestling Bound for Glory 2015. What? I'm not kidding you. I swear to God those are the first things that came up here. <laughs> then when I click on all results, I get Cookie, TNA, Rosita, TNA, TNA Gunner, Lisa Marie Verone, Luscious Velvet Sky, Robert, TNA, MCMG, Terry Sabu Brunk, who, by the way, Sabu has uh, significantly more uh, followers than uh, Lisa Marie Verone or Velvet Sky or uh, Rosita or Cookie. TNA Knockout, Billy Gunn, TNA Rhino. I could go on and on. That's what comes up on Facebook. But don't worry, everybody. Find them on Facebook. They're there. They didn't say it would be easy. <laughs> they just said find them. There's a TNA page. There's a TNA Nation page. There's a TNA Wrestling page. There's a TNA Straight Talk page. Dixie Carter page. Another TNA Wrestling page. Holy fuck. So after winning this battle royal and earning a title shot, Mr. Anderson then, uh, he brought up Sting, he referenced the Navy SEALs and Osama Bin Laden, and then he literally, literally threatened to shoot Sting in the head. So he said, yeah. Headshot bitch, I believe was his exact words. Yep, he said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be to you what the, uh, SEALs were to Bin Laden. Headshot bitch. No, he said, boom, headshot bitch. Those Ooh. were his exact words. Yes. Hmm. So then... So to sum it up, for the pay-per-view Sunday... There's going to be a match, and whoever wins will be shot by Mr. Anderson at the next pay-per-view, which, I might add, is on my fucking birthday. Oh. oh Mr. Anderson getting a title shot on my birthday. <laughs> Breaks my heart. So then the go-home show ended with Rob and Sting having a, a polite discussion. Can't say an argument or a promo. They were just chatting. In the middle of it, Anderson interrupted, and he plugged the pay-per-view. Not this pay-per-view. No, of course not. But he plugged the pay-per-view. The pay -per -view. next one. Not the one Sunday, everybody. The one after that. <laughs> and then it ended. I am spent. Let me play a song and then we're getting out of here. Impact, everybody. That was a, that was a decent show, too. <laughs> that was a decent program that we just watched. No, it wasn't. It was. It was a decent impact. By impact standards, that was a decent program. Play a song. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Because I learned this when I went to Toronto. And and Dave and I got to the hotel, and he flips on the TV, and he's he's watching Impact halfway through. And he just and he actually turns to me, and he goes, this show's really stupid. I was like, yeah. <laughs> he goes, you don't realize it when you're just watching it as a fan, how dumb this show is. I said, yeah. And then when the show was over, uh, Mansers came on. That show is much worse than Impact. I ain't gonna lie. No, that's true. That show is much worse than Impact. There, there are. I'm sure there are probably a lot of shows worse than Impact. There probably are. Well, your your wife watches many of them. But per, Jesus, but per wrestling standards, this show sucks. Let's play a song. To the back. All right, uh, Impact, Vinny. Mm -hmm. This was the first. Impact Wrestling show. Oh, yeah. And what a totally different world. What a big change Man. it was. I actually did not hate this show for the first hour. It wasn't like the best show or anything like that. There was still a lot of stupid stuff. But for the first hour, I was like, man, I've seen significantly worse. Then the second hour was just god-awful. It the show, is, the show is suicidal in that it appears to be designed to get itself off the air. <laughs> It appears to be a, deliber yeah. a deliberate attempt to make uh, to make viewers to turn viewers away, mm -hmm. and, and to make uh, to make the characters seem trivial and to make the viewing audience fools for investing their time in it. Mm -hmm. it, it it's a mind-boggling show. And the funny thing is, a lot of it seems often reminiscent of a. I know we've we may have made, we may have made this comparison before, but I saw things here that reminded me of a show that used to be on called Nitro. It's not on anymore. Try Thunder! There were some Thunder moments as well. Should we talk about it now? <laughs> That's, well, I thought we had, were starting. I thought we were done. No. We have not begun talking about this show yet. Impact opened the had a giant makeover that is basically, they turned everything blue. So it now looks like SmackDown instead of Raw. That is the absolutely only thing this has in, in common with SmackDown. Yeah. It's very blue. Yes. And it makes its viewing audience blue as well. So, Eric Bischoff came out to start off the new era. 
This new era, by the way, this whole new change was so important that neither Hulk Hogan nor Mick Foley were there. Yeah. They were in New York doing shit. Sightseeing, I hope. So Bischoff was going off about how he was in charge. This He was in charge. This is the new revolutionary TV show, everyone. Eric Bischoff talking about being in charge in 2011. Yeah. We but are in control. Last week was all about Foley showing up, and the very... The very point of why it's called Impact Wrestling instead of TNA Impact is because Hogan and Bischoff had control over Impact, and so the network ended up changing the name to Impact Wrestling so they wouldn't have power anymore. And in the very first fucking show of the new <laughs> no, era... No, the first segment of the first show. Bischoff has power again. So he then began to state his purpose in life. His How could you do this? <laughs> I don't because they're stupid. I mean, really? I mean, if you told me, right, the dumbest show ever, I could not have started this impact by saying that Eric Bischoff's in charge. <laughs> That's like the dumbest thing you can do. Yes. Yes, it is. They did. They built up this angle for months and months and months. They shoot the big angle last week. <laughs> Eric Bischoff and Hogan have lost all their power. And... Vince Russo's brilliant fucking idea is the first show of the new era. Eric Bischoff is put in charge. Yes. Mind boggling. It actually gets worse. What does that even mean, boggled? That's how you felt watching the show. So, like, my, my head is full of marbles? Is that what that means? Mind boggled? Mind boggled is not a marble game. It has cubes. What does the word dice. boggled mean? Why don't you Google that while I talk about the show? Don't go, don't talk about it yet. i got to look up boggled. I would like to go to bed before 4 a.m. Hold on. All right. Boggled. Uh, let's look at the Urban Dictionary. That will be even better. When you have a lot of shit going through your head. Well, there you go. Very stoned. It is the stage before bonoggled. So you're boggled, and then you're bonoggled, and then you're tronsoggled. This show tronsoggles my mind. You may continue. As I started to say, I think the next line he had was actually worse than the entire premise of this. Bischoff, as the man in charge of the company, said he wanted to, and this is a quote, Completely eliminate the X Division. <laughs> Why is that worse than, than putting him in charge? Why would anyone in charge of any company want to eliminate any branch of it? Because he doesn't like vanilla midgets. They don't make any money. He I can understand that. Several times on the show. The whole thing he about told, putting... He told the audience that this entire division is stupid and not worth caring about. Mm-hmm. And boy, was this reinforced over and over and over again. Yeah. So. the uh, This show, going back to the Urban Dictionary here, putting Bischoff in charge was a boggle fuck. I concur. Let me read the definition here. I don't really need to, but go ahead. A situation or environment which is without direction and doomed to failure. Yes. A quote. They threw their hands up in frustration. The meeting was a complete boggle fuck. Welcome to Impact, <laughs> Actually, everybody. That needs to be on a t-shirt. Yeah. TNA Impact. Bogglefuck. Bogglefuck matters. And the uh, the uh, synonyms here. Disaster, hopeless, screw-up, frustration, situation. Did they watch this show when they wrote this definition? <laughs> I guess. Is there... Can we, can we upload a photo of Impact Wrestling? Oh, look at this. Buy Bogglefuck mugs, t-shirts, and magnets. It's not a bad idea. I kind of want one. Oh. <laughs> Coffee mug. How about that? There is a bumper sticker that just reads "Boggle Fuck." I, and the coffee mug is most appropriate because I can I do feel boggle fucked in the morning before I have my coffee. Oh God, this show is just retarded. We we we've spent more time talking about this promo than the promo actually took. Now, Bischoff booked a bunch of matches for X Division geeks to lose: Kazarian versus Abyss, so they could get rescue the title from him; Red versus Joe, so Joe could kill him in a minute; and Matt Hardy versus the Bucks, so Matt Hardy could beat them up by himself. Matt Hardy and Eric Bischoff. That was technically the match, yes. Kendrick said he wanted a match, so Bischoff slapped him, because Bischoff is not afraid of this tiny little man. Of course not. He called them the Vanilla Midgets. They bleeped midgets. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they once have a show called Half Pint Brawlers? Isn't that the same network? Well, Half Pint's okay, but Midget apparently is On not. On that show, the guy said, I am a midget. I, I promote midget wrestling. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway. So. That was 16 minutes of boggle fuck, by the brawl, way. We're not done with this. Oh, it, that's right. The real boggle fuck there broke is out here. More. So. It was Kendrick and his friends versus the four guys in Immortal. It was a four on four fight. Kendrick and his friends got their asses kicked. Their lunch was eaten. It was a massacre. Fortune had to come out and make the save. At this point, the baby faces had the edge eight on four. Mm -hmm. They had four extra men. Yeah. And the brawl continued and the war waged on. Night fell, the sun rose, the battle continued. This was every bullshit impact segment that just goes on. There was on a dive and or something. On and on. And I repeat this the baby faces had an eight on four edge. Yeah. And it was still an even fight. Yeah. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. This was the segment of my nightmares. Yeah. This was a boggle soccer. Did you make that up or is that on there? It's on here, but it, I'm not going to read the definition because it doesn't make sense. We had a six-woman tag. Sarita and Rosita and Madison versus Mickey and Tess Mocker and Tara. I don't want to talk about the match at all. I want to talk about Miss Tess Mocker's ass. We all know it's great. And when she had her first match, there's an animated gif that shows her striding slowly across the screen and her ass takes up roughly a third of the image and it's fantastic. But there was a shot here where they cut to a wide shot and you could see the ring and all six women and a, a good chunk of the ringside area, like the pretty black mats on both sides. And so, you know, it's not like they were zoomed out on her. She, she she was a very small portion of this picture. And all I could see was her ass. In even that small little portion of the screen, it was still amazing. It's going to be literally two years before a impact review goes by where I don't mention that I cannot believe it took them two years to realize that Brooke Adams had a great ass. Yes. This is known as two not, years. not knowing the strengths of your talent. Epic fail. Yeah. Blunder. Clusterfuck. Fuck up. Calamity. Doom. Clusterfuck. Mistake. Failure. Catastrophe. Train wreck. Go on. Fuck up. We had Abyss wrestling Kazarian. Before the match, Bischoff told Abyss to destroy Kazarian. They actually had an X Division match. It was very fast paced. It was very back and forth. Abyss kept up and seemed actually totally in place in this match. And the wrestling here was completely, totally fine and enjoyable. Until the finish. Until the finish. Abyss went for the uh, uh, Vader splash off the corner. And uh, Kazarian rolled out of the way. Abyss landed very hard on his knee. It looked like it sucked. Kazarian immediately pounced. He went to attack the knee. The ref pulled him off and said, no, no, I must make sure he is not injured. And then... Abyss got to his feet and kicked Kazarian in the, in the belly. He was now standing fine. He hit the black hole slam and won the match in the title. Because you see, Abyss, the 300-pound monster, outsmarted Kazarian. The heel outsmarted the babyface. The X Division guy, besides being small and puny, is also a fuckwad. A moron. I was going to say a fuck trout. A fucktard. A dipshit. A fuck titty. A fool. Look down upon this man. Spit on him. He's dumb. Dumber than Chris Harris looked last week. <laughs> well, let's not be ridiculous. That was the story they told. However, I will say this was the best match on Impact in like the, the rest, 10 years. I had no complaints about the wrestling. Both guys did a hell of a job. If Abyss would have just beaten him, <laughs> I love sort of God. I, I talked about just beating guys on, on Tuesday, but I'm going to say this here. If Abyss would have just beaten Kazarian... Kazarian would have looked like less of an idiot than to get beaten uh -huh. because you were outsmarted by the heel. Because you're an idiot. You're not as smart as Chris Parks. <laughs> you're not as smart as a man with no teeth and barbed wire gashes all and over him. been lit on fire. So then Abyss looked in the camera and he said, It's like Sun Tzu said. The art of war is to subdue your enemy without fighting. Mm -hmm. I just watched you fight your enemy for like 10 minutes. Yeah. Speaking of minutes... Amazing Red wrestled Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe squashed him in less than a minute. He beat up uh, Red, Red more, and then Crimson made the save. So, wrestling matters, everyone, which means we're going to bury Red and push Crimson. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Duh. <laughs> wrestling matters. And again, the X Division guys are geeks. You should not care about them. And if you ever have cared about them, then fuck you. That was the message of the show. <laughs> AJ cut a promo in a neck brace. 
He had not uh <laughs> he didn't have like a cervical injury no, or disc damage, no. He said he had strained ligaments in his neck. Yeah. After he piled over through a table, he called Dreamer out. He then proceeded to cut a babyface promo on Tommy Dreamer. He said he uh, respected Tommy and understood the situation. I was wondering where the fuck this was going. Dreamer said that he interpreted this as AJ saying that Dreamer only won because AJ went into the match with a bad neck. He said, last time I, I killed you because I was forced to. Tonight I'm going to kill you because I want to. And he laid into AJ and... To be fair, he actually got a pretty damn good uh, heel promo. It was a great promo because he didn't cry for once. He didn't cry. He was and just it, mad. He was an angry, defiant uh, uh, heel. He cut a promo on the fans, talked about how they will turn on you. After all you sacrifice for them, you can't trust them. It's not worth it. They won't pay your bills. The whole time he was cutting this promo, he was laying a stomping on AJ. AJ finally started to make a comeback, and Bully Ray cut him off, and Daniels ran in, and I assume it's going to lead to Daniels and AJ versus Dreamer and Bully Ray, which is fine. This promo, this segment was... This was awesome. a hell of an angle, actually. Uh, on the whole, this is a good segment, yes. So, for those of you keeping track, for those of you that accuse me of bias, when in fact, you are the bias ones, because you cannot see the flaws in Impact, I will say, as a perfectly unbiased source here on the show, in the first hour of this program, you had a great match and a great angle. You know what? I am biased. And I will tell you, they had a great match and a great angle. Yeah. This, yes, the first hour of this show was fun. Angle came out. He thanked China for getting for her help and getting rid of Karen. It was the end of this segment that everything turned around for the worst. Maybe not even the end. Eh, the end. That was the end. Yeah. The fans were chanting, that was awesome about the match, which is funny. He uh, announced that uh, he thanked China, but then said she would not be back, and the fans booed. <laughs> He uh, they apparently want to see China fall down and doing more body slams. Then he you said know, he people was... want her back. Who? Oh, well, the fans? Yeah. I mean, when you watch the match, it was clear they were into her. So to me, you don't have to lie to the fans and say she's going to be back when she's not. But you also don't have to tell them she ain't coming back. <laughs> you just so don't... If, you're, if you're tuning in to see her, you don't have to tune in next week. She's yeah. not going to be back. Yes. She's gone. Which is the case, but... And it should be, but... So he announced he was going to wrestle Jarrett at the next pay-per-view and that it would be a top contenders match. Jarrett came out. He said every time that uh, he had wrestled Angle, way, he won. By the way, yes, after feuding for six months, the culmination of their feud is a wrestling match. Yeah. They started in a cage! I remember this, yes. So, yes, Jarrett said he beat Kurt every time they wrestled. It wasn't Karen's fault for distracting Kurt. It was, Kurt. it was Kurt's fault for getting distracted. He eventually baited Kurt into agreeing to put his gold medal on the line. Kurt agreed. Is this part? Or yes, because uh, then Jared's... Was, Karen showed up in a wheelchair. Somebody's music was playing. I don't remember. It was Jared's, of course. And she came up through the stage like Kurt does. She was in a wheelchair. She was laughing. So China didn't get rid of her at all. She's still around. Yeah, she's fine. She's in a wheelchair, but she's mad. She sure has a taped ankle. She was cutting a promo about promising to be a slam anniversary when Velvet Sky appeared behind her. Kurt was laughing. Jarrett was pointing behind her. Karen wouldn't turn around. Finally, Velvet <laughs> pushed the wheelchair down the ramp. Mm -hmm. She bonked into Jeff. Hilarity ensued. No, there was no hilarity whatsoever. Why did they do this? I don't know. Why did they need Karen there? Why, if they were going to bring back Karen, was she foiled in her first appearance back? What does Velvet Sky have to do with any of this? I know she was accused of being uh, Angles uh, whatever, but she's got another feud going. So why is she in two completely, completely different that programs is, that have nothing to do with one another? That's an excellent question. And and uh, why did this go from serious to comedy? I, I don't know. Because they don't know what they're doing. Okay. This segment sucked. We had a very brief segment with the Bucks where they acknowledged they this had been... This segment sucked. They acknowledged they had been feuding together, but tonight they would agree to work together for the good of the X Division. Really? They weren't just friends like last week and at the pay-per-view? <laughs> this was like this was like a segment they shot like four weeks ago, and, and then they, they just randomly now. put it in this show. <laughs> See, They've been friends for two and a half weeks now! Three! Your point is valid. It was a good segment at the wrong time. It wasn't even a good segment. Their acting was hideous. Well, okay. 
it was a poorly produced segment. There was nothing good about this. I will, I will only say, I will at least they acknowledge there there was a shred of internal logic here. They acknowledge that these guys were once feuding and now are friends. Yes, it should have been weeks ago, but this is better than what they usually do. Baby steps. I'm trying to find the positive in the show. This is like I don't I don't care. Bischoff was talking to Hogan on the phone. They sounded very confident that Hogan would win a court case or a meeting or whatever the fuck he was doing, and they would get control back. Then Bischoff said he would uh, win his match. Knock out some more vanilla. Beep! Yes, there's some some more vanilla midgets here. The midgets got beeped again. The Jarrett's were bitching. Ah! This this was... (laughs) the, The show had gone downhill. This was where it just plunged off the cliff. So... As stupid as it was... To go from serious to comedy and bring out Karen and wheel her down the ramp and have her bonk into Jared in a wheelchair and they both go down and she's selling it like she's dead. As stupid as that was, at least you could say, all right, we officially wanted to write Karen out of the storyline. Ten minutes later, maybe, it may have been five, Karen is backstage fine. She's totally fine. Between... China tapping her out and Velvet pushing her down the ramp. They had written her out of the storyline twice, and she won't go away. She's totally fine. She's bitching. She's... I don't even know. But uh, Jared got a call and said Velvet will be facing Angeline in winter tonight. I presume Hulk Hogan called him. Who called him? I don't know. <laughs> Who's booking this show? Because it know. wasn't McFoley. I don't know. So apparently... I'm thinking maybe last week's segment didn't even happen. Were we imagining that segment? Because this is the same goddamn show I saw two weeks ago. I don't know. I hated this hour. <laughs> this was a very bad hour. And then it got worse. Ah! <laughs> this match. Listen. Generation Me wrestled Matt Hardy and Eric Bischoff. Here's what happened, everyone. Matt Hardy wrestled the two of them by himself. Yes. He dominated them to the point where one of them was just, just erased from the match entirely. The other was disabled and helpless in the ring. Then Matt Hardy helped him up and held him so that Eric Bischoff could hit some karate kicks. Yes. Then Eric Bischoff pinned the buck. Generation me, dead. Forever. They dead. Never recover from this. These two little girls got beat up by the fat guy and the old man. <laughs> the heel <laughs> single-handedly beat up both baby faces. Dominated them. Dom- them. This, is, this is not, well, we'll discuss what Velvet did later, but this is not a flash pin out of nowhere. He kicked their ass. Yeah. They need eight more guys. Yeah. Two well, on one's not enough. It has to be seven on one. Well, of course. My math sucks right now, but you get my point. So. I did love when Matt Hardy used the ice pick. That apparently is his wacky submission. I love mode. ice cold Matt Hardy. <laughs> so. Uh, what, what? Mike Tanae. Ice then, cold Matt Hardy. I, cold blood Matt Hardy. Cold Blood, that's right. That, I'm sorry. Totally different. Cold Blood, Matt Hardy with the ice pick. That's 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 better than the Angelic Diablo. <laughs> it's true. But that is like, I don't know. So then Mike Tanay said the following words, which I am not making up. Eric Bischoff just put the bullet in the X Division. Well, he sure did. Word. You know, I'm sure that like their idea is, oh, well... You know, now the X Division's going to get... Well, we got to put more heat on them. And then more heat. And then more heat. And then eventually the X Division's going to make a comeback. No, 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 no. This is not putting heat on them. No, 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 I'm just telling you this is what they're thinking. Because they do this all the time. They're like, okay, well, you know, the heels are going to kill the baby faces, and they're going to kill the baby faces, and they're going to kill the baby faces, and then eventually the baby faces will make a comeback. But, of course, the angle always gets dropped before the baby faces make a comeback. Not only that. What does this remind you of, by the way? Scott Steiner beating up geeks on Nitro. Farther back, the entire fucking NWO. That too, yeah. Why do you think people chanted WCW sucks? Besides the fact that it sucked. <laughs> Because the NWO beat up WCW for four years, and WCW never got a comeback. That's all these people know. It's how to book wrestling so that you kill companies. So that you die. (laughs) So that death How to book a company to death. Twice. Yep. Way to go, you geeks. What a... The ice pick! I don't know what that is. That's so not worth complaining about on this show. (laughs) The ice pick. 
Winter was talking to Stone Angelina backstage, and I say that, by the way, she was in character, not the, uh, I don't think she was really on drugs here. I have to clarify that on Impact sometimes. Winter said that after tonight, there would be no more Velvet. They would be happy like they were before. They shared a brief tender kiss. Did they? Yeah, yeah they, I think there was like a hint of lip-to-lip contact. It was not like a, hmm. not terribly scandalous. Then we had the match. It was Winter and Angelina versus Velvet. Remember last ah! week? Remember? No, wait. Remember last week when it said, find us on Facebook? Yeah. I think this is actually worse because all it said was, impact on Facebook, become a fan. <laughs> At least you know to search Impact. At least telling you to find us on Impact is letting you know you have to search for us. Become a fan is just like, find your own way how. This Wish on a star. You know what made me mad about this match besides the fact that it was just god horrendous awful? The fact that Samoa Joe and Red got one minute. Yes. And this match got like five. Yeah. It just kept going and going and going. Here's what happened, everyone. Winter and Angelina beat Velvet up for five straight minutes. Then Velvet rolled up Angelina and pinned her. And by the way, let me just say this for people to think that, oh, Brian's biased. He just doesn't like TNA. Blah, 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 blah. I shouldn't even acknowledge these fuck-ups. But anyway, the uh, the one-minute match with Joe and Red, as stupid as it was to go one minute, that was like the best one-minute match I've seen in, in like a year. That was awesome! <laughs> but it went one minute. Anyway. So, yeah, wrestling matters, everyone. Wrestling matters. Yeah, wrestling matters. So, this, Velvet... This is what they're talking about when wrestling matters. Angelina and Winter versus Velvet for five minutes, with Angelina not selling. Not only that, but the whole point of the storyline has been, you know, Velvet trying to free her friend or get revenge on her friend or whatever. She just pinned her here. Angle over! Yeah. She defeated them! In yeah. a fair fight, she beat them both. hmm So, Velvet then rolls out... And then she begins, apparently, her third program when ODB attacks her. Yeah. I'm just going to read off some quotes here. No, let me let me read these off, because there's a point to it. I have a few. <laughs> Midget is banned from this program. Yeah. However, you can call someone a bitch and a dirty whore. Repeatedly. Okay. <laughs> these are a few quotes. Taz, his reaction to her... His entire reaction to ODB reappearing and destroying Velvet for no reason. He had two words to say. They're bigger. Taking things very seriously here. Her tits. I know. <laughs> he doesn't care about the beating at all. Of course not. Of ODB, course not. happy to see me, you whore, she said. The crowd was chanting, ODB, ODB. <laughs> They're, I mean... This is a lot well, about. Well, Velvet the, is the worst baby face. It says a history. lot about the crowd too. But yes, this company is so fucking stupid that they had a woman ambushed after beating two, uh, after beating up two other women in a fair fight, and they stole Shannon for the girls that ambushed her. <laughs> and then I quote myself: "I hate that woman." <laughs> Referring to ODB. Really? I, I do. We had shit with Miss Tessmacher and Eric Young. Actual sentence. By Eric Young. Orlando's been showing me these in our studio apartment. Because TNA wrestlers are poor. Yeah. They are... They're living together. In a studio. <laughs> studio. In a fucking studio. They don't, have, they don't even have rooms. They have a studio. I don't even want to acknowledge this segment because it was the most painfully unfunny segment since the last Eric Young segment. I, well, yeah. Uh, Gunner arrived... He explained that on their other show that nobody watches, he lost his title to Eric. Then he beat him up and took a belt. I remember, like, how many times have I told this story? About six years ago, there was a show here in Washington. Eric Young was on the show. I watched the show. I was like, this guy is, like, unbelievably funny, unbelievably good in the ring, unbelievably talented. Goddamn, why has anybody picked him up? Here he is five years later. Way to go, TNA. You have got nothing out of Eric Young. You have taken every one of Eric's strengths and, and just killed him dead. And, and you've, you've highlighted all of Eric Young's weaknesses. And, and it just keeps going. Ric Flair called out Bobby Roode. 
He was angry that he had submitted to Rude's armbar and lethal lockdown match. I'm glad you got something out of this. I Well, barely. This was great delivery by two men, I and I had... I understood about 10% of what they were talking this about. This was like when, when uh, Russo went up to them like the week before and he goes, okay, you guys are going to talk in the main event segment on on, uh, on Wrestling Matters next week. Here's here's your dialogue. And he handed them a five-page script each. Yeah. And they tried their best to, to comprehend talk it. Talk and talk and talk and talk. You know when Dave is always talking about how, oh, you know, people forget their lines all the time on Impact. I fucking wonder why! <laughs> Yeah, so... Talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and so, this and that and history in my arm, my leg, my dick. Let me get the gist of what? Let me get the gist of this promo out of the way. <laughs> Flair, Flair was upset that Robert Roode had had the gall to submit him with an arm bar and lethal lockdown. He beat him with a wrestling hold and a wrestling match. Now he's a heel. I'm fine with that. Robert Roode was apologetic. He seemed to have regret defeating this man, using a wrestling hold in a wrestling match. Flair dared him to try it again. Rude didn't want to. Finally, he did. Immortal saved. Four guys jumped him. They held his arm down. They whacked him with the chair. They broke his arm. Where the fuck was James Storm? Where the fuck were the nine other guys could, in Fortune? And I don't know. They were out getting laid, like like Flair said. Maybe they were. You were out getting drunk and getting laid. That's what he said he, he brought to the table when he was mentoring them. I guess so. Because that's what wrestling's all about, everybody. In 2011. We had a backstage clip of Sting walking around. Swear to God, that's all that happened. So Sting came out for a promo. He had 90 seconds to kill. <laughs> Remember when AJ called him Stink? <laughs> Stink? You're wrong. <laughs> that's what the man said. I Don't blame me. make this funny. Sting came out. He had 90 seconds to cut a promo in the main event. He put Rob Van Dam over. So he still wanted to take power away from Hogan and Bischoff. Then he said, right as soon as he beat Rob Van Dam, Anderson was in his face immediately. Music played. Lights went out. Who should appear but Sting from 1995. Maybe earlier. 1990. Yeah. It was Ken Anderson and Sting makeup and gear. Frankly, it was a terrifyingly accurate portrayal. It looked exactly like Sting from 95. 90. I keep saying that. And how did Taz sell this? He said, and I quote, How clever. <laughs> And then 80s... Taz does not give a fuck. Early yes. 90s Sting laid out 2011 Sting, and the show ended. And then the show that ended. That was the entire angle. Second hour of this goddamn show was the worst, just the worst. Just the worst. The show must die. <laughs> Fortunately, that appears to be their goal. It has to be their goal. There's no other explanation for their this Their goal shit. cannot be to live. It can't be to put on a good program. No, that's, that's they just... They cannot think this is quality. Oh, my God. Let's play a song here. I've, 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 uh, uh, yeah. I have, uh, I have, uh, I, I, I'm spent. <laughs> 